Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions in partnership with the League of Women Voters. We are so honored to have you all tonight for our City Council Forum. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kimberly Jackson and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, which is Yes, for those of you all who aren't familiar with us, we are a non-partisan um, think tank created by Congressman Bill Young, whose goal was to have social, political, and economic discussions in a civic manner. And we're so honored to carry that legacy on at St. Petersburg. Space is at the Seminole campus, but we are everywhere doing a lot of things. Tonight we have our forum of District 8, District 1, and District 4. And I'd like to thank Al Rochelle, who has graciously agreed to be our moderator for tonight and give up his time and talent in his retirement. I think I've made him work hard during this time. <laughs> I don't know if, who doesn't know who Al Rochelle is, but he led Bay News 9 in 1997 and before that was an icon in the community for six years and only retired in 2019 to give his time time and talent to our community, which we're so grateful for. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Al to discuss the format for tonight and to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. And yes, I love retirement. I would advise it to anybody that to, uh, retirement's a good thing. By the way, welcome to the 2021 City of St. Pete City Council Candidate Forum. It's not a debate, it's a forum which gives us more time to express what these candidates stand for. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, the League of Women Voters of St. Petersburg. The League is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. The mission is simple, empowering voters, defending democracy. I think more than a dozen debates with the League. They're great folks. The council members are elected to serve four-year terms and are limited to two full consecutive terms of office. There are eight districts in the city of St. Pete. Primary races are held in those districts which have more than two candidates. Candidates running in districts two and six are not in the primary, but they will appear on the general election ballot. And tonight, we will meet for those candidates competing in the August 24th primary, the city council race in districts one, four, and eight. Now, candidates Bobby Shea Lee and candidate Hobbs had scheduling conflicts, so they were not able to join us today. A couple of reminders, voter registration coming up on July the 26th. If you plan to mail in your ballot, please mail it as soon as possible. You can request a ballot by visiting the Supervisor of Elections website, that's votepinellas.com, or you can call 727-464-VOTE. Mail ballots can be dropped off at the Supervisor of Elections office during office hours. All right, ground rules very quickly because I want to get right to the candidates. We appreciate your being here tonight. We know there are in lots of forums and you've already participated in them, so chalk this up as another one. Tonight's program will consist of two segments. Segments one will be the four candidates for District 8 sitting on the stage right now. That'll last about four minutes. Segment two will be the three candidates for District 1 and the four candidates in District 4. That segment will last approximately 50 minutes. If you do your math, we'll be here until about 8.30. We will not have any opening or closing statements. The first two questions, the candidates will have one minute for their reply. All other questions will have 30 seconds to respond. We have a timer on hand right in the front there, and I'll be polite if you run over your time, and I will gently cut you off if necessary, or come up running the stage and grab your microphone away from you. I don't know which. The candidates will start alphabetically in rotate order. Uh, the question we have is very complicated sheet that'll do this, and hopefully we'll get it right, and I won't have to go back and apologize for not getting the right person. You ready? So here we go. One minute question. Here's our first one, and uh, silence your phones if you would. Thank you very much. Bring home a gallon of 2%. Okay, thank you. So here's the first question, and our first candidate is candidate Danner. What makes you the best qualified for the office you are seeking? You have one minute. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I have the experience of being a former city council member. I won this seat in 2005, again in 2009. I've uh, been active in this community for over 30 years. I was a planning commissioner, historic preservation commissioner. After my term on council, I went on to be on the public art commission, served with four different mayors. Uh, I don't even know how many police chiefs or city council members. Um, it's just a real important, there's a lot of really important things going on in our city right now. Big projects, small projects. And I really believe that what we need is experience. I know how to get through the sort of quagmire of ordinances and city government, building coalitions with my colleagues, listening to the community, dealing with the staff, 
and the um, mayor's administration. Um, it's a great time in our city. There's a lot of fantastic things going on, and I really look forward to serving again. All right, candidate Floyd, same question. If you would, what makes you the best qualified for the office you're seeking? Yeah, so my name's Rishi Floyd. I'm a former electrical engineer turned public school teacher. Uh, and more importantly than that, I'm a community organizer. I've organized on issues in the city uh, and in the state, uh, such as the $15 minimum wage, criminal justice reform, voting rights reform, and more. And uh, I've worked with the city council to figure out how to create solutions to these issues. And I've worked through the city council as, at times when I've had to as well. Uh, and more importantly than that, I know that uh, as a community organizer, nothing's more important than getting the community involved. And so what I've worked hard to do throughout my campaign is uh, connect with the community and make sure that people are aware of the issues that are going on in the city. And that's what I'll continue to do as a city councilor. Great, thank you. Candidate Kaplicki. Yeah, I was born and raised here in Pinellas County and growing up understand streets and avenues and understand the people that make up St. Pete. Uh, I work as a healthcare provider. I'm a local optometrist and I understand the background of our healthcare field. I've also had a degree or I've also earned a degree in finance, I know how to balance a budget. And I've served in many different leadership roles between USF St. Petersburg with the St. Pete Young Professionals and at Indiana University as a treasurer in the, uh, in the College of Optometry. So I know how to get things done, and I know how to get people behind a group to all get on the same page so that we can accomplish great things. And I have a proven track record of doing that, and I look forward to being your next city council member. Great. Candidate Mayo, please. Thank you. I am Jamie Mayo. I've been in your community for about 40 years. I'm a small business owner. I think that's an important thing that I bring to the table. I employ people, I rally for people, and um, I think those are definitely important qualities. Um, after going through Leadership St. Pete, uh, it ignited my love for a city that prior to that I just lived, and now it's my city that I have a passion for um, serving. I know how to get things done, and I also always tease that after raising four teenagers, oh. I um, have the ability to say no, even when you're looking for a yes. Great, thank you so much. All right, let's go to our next question. Give me the top three priorities if you're elected. And we start out with candidate Mayo. You have one minute now. Thank you. Um, these are specific to District 8. We have many issues throughout our city that I'm super passionate about. But as it relates to our district, um, again, being a small business owner, I really want to rally and come alongside uh, the businesses that have pivoted and had to change and through our current economic environment. Um, Certainly affordable housing. You know, District 8 has some really great affordable housing uh, opportunities for us. So that would be exciting to play a really big role in that. And um, I am certainly a big supporter of our youth and feel like we really need to come alongside our youth in our district specifically. All right, thank you. Candidate Danner, give me uh, three priorities if you're elected, reelected. Yeah, the three priorities are most important to District 8 are the balance between the development we're seeing, which we want, but also protecting the character of our neighborhoods, our traditional neighborhoods, our historic neighborhoods, keeping them affordable for new home buyers, retirees, everyone that's in there. Another thing we have to address is the homeless issue. Uh, with COVID, some of the shelters were, were closed or cut down way below capacity. I served on the Homeless Leadership Board for years. We've got to get those services back and help those people. And we also have to address the crime on 34th Street. It's been a longstanding problem. Development is, is starting to take care of some of that with the hotels that have ingrained the illegal activity. And it's really time to step up and take care of that issue once and for all. Candidate Floyd. So the three issues I'm most focused on on the campaign trail are uh, the economic plight of working people in uh, St. Petersburg and in District 8, uh, particularly around affordable housing, creating permanently affordable housing for people, and, you know, raises in uh, expectations and uh, it's well. Uh, you know, it's, nothing's more important than making sure people put uh, food on our table and have a roof over their head. And then, you know, making sure that we protect our environment. We're a very vulnerable city to climate change, and I, I don't think that we can ignore that at all. 
And then uh, finally, I would say, uh, you know, continuing the movement for social justice that defines St. Petersburg, be it the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for LGBTQ rights. And candidate Kaplicki. You know, coming out of the COVID-19 crisis and really still in the midst of it, number one is supporting our working families. And underneath that umbrella of a topic, you can package many things like affordable housing, you know, fighting for fair wages. Um, beyond that, I think that we need to really protect our environment. You, know, you see where we live. We're in one of the most vulnerable communities in the United States. And if there is an elephant in the room, um, then we're just kidding ourselves. But the elephant in the room is climate change and we're gonna be faced with it. I'm 35, I plan on living the rest of my life and dying here in St. Pete. I hope that's a long and fruitful life, but I want this to be a St. Pete that's not underwater and that isn't impacted by climate change in a detrimental way. The last thing I look to do is to support our local businesses and our small businesses, but do that while maintaining our city's unique character and vibe. Great, all right, audience question. These you have 30 seconds. And thank you audience for submitting these questions. I'll try to read them properly. What will you do if elected to lead with maturity and professionalism during council meetings, including the treatment of city staff? Mr. Kaplicki, you have the first answer on that, 30 seconds. Yeah, the, um, the, the one thing you need to know is, is my character. I've always been a player, a team sports player. And you know, when it comes down to it, I've been a captain of many teams. And when you're a captain and a leader of a group of people, you need to understand the qualities and the characteristics of that group and what makes that group succeed. So I'll be someone that works together with my council members. And if there's an issue that we are, you know, causing some friction on or there's some friction, you know, on different topics, you know, we can get past that and figure out what's gonna be the best result and the best things that we can do for the residents of St. Petersburg as a whole. I'm in I'm gonna teach tree to with respect and kindness and um you know even if we don't disagree we're gonna get along candidate danner same question yes i learned very quickly before you have to have a relationship with the staff that the mayor and the council members are temporary occupants of city hall the staff's been there for years they have the institutional knowledge and experience to get the things done you want so it's very important to build those relationships with them while having a cordial relationship with your colleagues, the Sunshine Law prevents you from having those conversations, but you also have to engage the community. So if the community is supportive of the ideas, they're the ones that will tell your colleagues on council to support it and keep things moving. Candidate Floyd. Yeah, so nothing's more important to me than dignity in the workplace. I'm a union activist and I've stood with my coworkers time and time again to make sure that we receive dignity in the workplace. And so when it comes to city staff, I'll do the exact same thing. Um, I think, you know, city staff need to be, uh, supported and respected uh, in everything they do in the city. And so that's the same energy that I'll take to city council. All right, great candidates. You're doing a great job keeping your times. I really appreciate that. Let's go to question number four. What can be done to improve the safety of our streets and neighborhoods? Uh, candidate Floyd, you're first up on this 30 second question. Yeah, so I wish I had more than 30 seconds for this one. But what I'll say is that, uh, you know, what we need to do is make sure uh, the safest street is a street that has support, uh, be that social services or economic opportunity for people. Um, and so that's what I'll look to do as a city councilor is make sure that we uh, uplift the economic plight of working people, but not just working people, but poor people and homeless people as well. Uh, you know, with fewer people on the streets, um, you know, don't have opportunity to look forward to, we'll have less crime as well. So that's what I'll work for. Mr. Kaplicki. You know, I think that one of my main priorities that I didn't get a chance to mention before is bolstering our neighborhood associations and getting more involvement so that your neighbors know who you are and they know what's going on and they're willing to speak up if something is out of context. You know, in addition to that, I really think that we need to show respect to our police officers and they need to show respect to the community. And we need to have a strong community tie between the police officers and our residents and neighbors. In addition to that, there's been so many traffic incidents where people are getting hit with their cars and I think we need to address that. All right, candidate Mayo. Yes, thank you. Um, I mentioned this at a, a forum from last night that it's a puzzle and we need to bring these puzzle pieces together. So it's not just like one little answer. The first thing we need to address is our youth and giving them opportunities to develop and grow and feel like they have a future and a hope. And then creating small business opportunities. And lastly, 
not all the puzzle, but the last part would be creating an environment of safety for people to live and thrive in. All right, candidate Danner. Yes, I've always been a strong supporter of community policing. St. Pete's had some version of community policing for decades. It seems to kind of shift around a bit, but a strong community police force really engages the neighborhoods. I've seen firsthand young kids change their attitudes towards the police when they see them talking to me, talking to the neighbors, understanding that they're on their side. And I think it would be good to get back to a really strong community police force in our city. Great candidates, thank you. Let's go to question number five. What actions will you take to promote equitable economic development across all communities and neighborhoods? Uh, Danner, Mr. Danner, you have the first one. Yeah, this is a, a challenging thing. It goes with the affordable housing that our small businesses are getting priced out of their places because the rents are going up with the development we're seeing. So first and foremost, we need to protect those small businesses. There are programs that we have and we need to um, continue to have and, and supplement more to provide grants and opportunities, education facilities for small businesses to um, grow them and keep them in place. Um, we can do that citywide. If we start with the smaller businesses, they grow to become larger businesses. That is the backbone of our economic place in St. Pete. Candidate Floyd. Uh, yeah, so I, I've already been doing this throughout the campaign and throughout my organizing work in the past is, is supporting uh, plans like the community benefits agreement that makes the developers negotiate with the community to make sure that they provide benefits to the community when they come in and develop things. I mean, I think what's most important is to make sure that uh, wealth that's built in the city goes to the people that need it the most and not just people who stash profits offshore or in some other city. And so uh, I think I'll look to expand upon developments like that and make sure that they are the toughest uh, things that we can get under state law. Yeah, we need to support our small businesses as a local community. Uh, we also really need to make good use or great use out of our CBA. You know, we have an opportunity to hold developers accountable to creating jobs and paid internships for youth out of that program. Uh, last but not least, you know, I think that we need to make sure that our residents are healthy. You know, we need to make sure that they have equitable access to health care to, to nutritious food, especially here in a food desert that's just about a mile and a half away. And we need to make sure that they can have access to, do, to, um, to digital media and bridge that digital divide that's been taking place. Um, again, I see this as uh, a puzzle and everybody else has mentioned uh, supporting the small businesses of our community to thrive and create more jobs and give people just basic opportunity. We have areas in our city that are non-developed, not underdeveloped, they are non-developed and they are uh, begging for help. And I'm really excited to be able to step in and give them support. All right, okay, I'm gonna do something because I can do this as the moderator. The next question, I'm gonna give you a minute uh, on purpose. Baseball, very complicated. What is your view of the Tropicana field development process so far? And you have a minute because I think this is a big, big deal for the city of St. Petersburg from all aspects. And we'll start out with candidate Mayo. Thank you. Um, well, being a baseball family, we were, I would be devastated if we lost our baseball team. Um, but it, it doesn't go um, unnoticed that we have um, a community that really feels like they were robbed many years ago of their, their place to live. So I'm excited about the redevelopment. I've taken the time to look at some of the um, developers, the two developers that have been pre-selected. Um, part of my opinion is I believe that those final decisions should occur after November in January when we have a new mayor. And um, I'm supportive of a um, new stadium, although I, I love our stadium, so. All right, Mr. Danner, same question, and you have a full minute. Thank you, this is a fantastic opportunity. The uh, Tropicana Field Development Site gives us a once in a lifetime opportunity, 86 acres but yet it's only been used 90 times a day for the last 30 some years. Uh, this opportunity to work with the Rays, come up with a solution that leaves baseball in there with the multi-use stadium and still
far, uh, we've rushed a little bit in through, throughout our process and we've maybe not taken the time to listen to the raise as much as possible. More importantly than that uh, is how we handle it going forward as candidates or as a potential city councilor. And I think what's most important to me is not exactly what's at the site, but how we make good on the things that have uh, been wronged in the past. Uh, specifically, I want I'll work to see that we have contractual obligations for how much affordable housing is going to be built at the site, how many living wage jobs are going to be at the site, and how those jobs are going to be given to the people who were uh, affected the first time that uh, we made mistakes in the site. Uh, last time, it was just a resolution that said we'd give jobs. We need uh, contractual obligations to hold people accountable and uh, things that we can do if those things aren't held accountable because uh, the promises of the past can't be repeated. Mr. Kaplicki? I think we have a fantastic opportunity ahead of us that's really unseen anywhere else in the country. Uh, I think the current administration has been steadfast. They want to get this done, but you know, I think ultimately this is going to fall on the next administration to figure out the future of the Tropicana Field Redevelopment Site. Um, at any rate, I think we need to tie in the community that was left behind. I'm all for renaming that site, the Gas Plant District, once again. And I think we have an opportunity to bring in all different types of affordable and attainable workforce housing, to bring in businesses, to bring in restaurants, retail, a new stadium. I was born and raised here. I, I love the Rays. You know, I've been to so many important Rays games and you know, would love to see the Rays stay here. But if it's not to the benefit of the community, then we need to look elsewhere. You know, but I really do think that we can work out a good deal with the Rays to keep them here. Um, last but not least, I think we need to have a convention center and a technological job training center on that site and also some hotel space. And this needs to be a space that can benefit all residents that everyone can use. And then it can be an economic generator for our city. And you can see multimodal transportation come in and out of that site. All right. And I'm going to uh, exert my privilege one more time for another minute one because this is a very important issue. Um, what do you think is the most important environmental issue facing St. Petersburg? And what would you do specifically in the next two years or three years to address any kind of global warming issues the city of St. Petersburg will face? You'll have a minute. Mr. Kaplicki, you're first. You know, the most important issue is the neighborhood environmental disparities and or and the environmental injustice that's taken place. And that's only going to be magnified as we go forward. Sea level rise is inevitable, and we need to do things to thicken our coastline, to stop building, you know, these big, you know, uh, units in the coastal high hazard areas and developing more along our coastline. I really need to think that we need to get down to the wire and address our infrastructure. The integrated water resources master plan is a big one that one of us is going to face, and we're going to have to make a decision on the level of of our budget or the level of a plan that we decide to do. And I'm all for the advanced plan in that integrated water resources management plan. You know, this is a city that my grandchildren or my children and my grandchildren, I hope will grow up in and I want them to be here and to be a place that's not inundated by water and climate change. Candidate Mayo, you have a minute for this environmental issues? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be honest, I've spent my life um, serving in a social way and I do not have a bunch of um, education on environmental issues. I um, They're definitely in the forefront right now because they're coming up a lot during our candidacy and um, out campaigning. So it's not that they're non-issue, but I'm not going to speak to things that I don't have the education and the knowledge to speak to. But what I will bring to the table is a concern I bring to the table the um, ability to come into it with an open mind and listen, and I guess most importantly, learn. All right, candidate Enter. Yes, of all the things that are gonna affect us with climate change, the one that's gonna get us the most and the soonest are our tidal conditions. We're surrounded by water on three sides. Tidal issues that cause flooding right now three, four times a year are going to increase tenfold over the next five to ten years. We've got to address how we deal with that, whether that's raising the sea wall, how we build our resiliency, because it's going to come a day where once a week we're going to have a tidal issue in our low-lying areas in the city, and that's got to be the priority to address that first. All right. Candidate Floyd. Yeah, so... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so... Okay. Uh, yeah, so climate change is, uh, you know, the biggest issue facing us. 
as a city, but uh, more importantly than that, it's it's how climate change takes place. It's it's who it affects the most. And so, you know, working and poor people are going to be the first people on the front lines. And this isn't something that's coming in the future. This is something that's already happening right now as we speak. Um, I mean, I can say from example, uh, it, the winter storms in Texas this past year broke down supply lines and my medicine was late coming to me. And this is already going to happen. This is already happening and will continue to happen in the future. So I think resiliency is one thing that I'll work on, how we combat the storms and sea level rise and how we make sure that we center people who are going to need the most help in those uh, issues. And so uh, we have things in the city like resiliency hubs that are being developed in neighborhoods like Child's Park, where neighborhoods are working on these issues together to make sure that we can bounce back from storms. I've been supportive of that organizing already, and I'll continue to do that as I'm a city councilor. All right, great. All right, let's go back to the 30 seconds, and I think I'll have, uh, I'll skip back to a minute when I'll tell you, because I, I think some of these uh, topics deserve a, li a little more thought and a little more fleshing out. Um, and let's do a minute on this one, too. What can be done to improve race relations in our community, and how would you define where they stand right now? Candidate Floyd. Yeah, so it's a stark contrast in the city right now when we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on things like baseball stadiums that tore down uh, African-American homes or a pier for $100 million when we haven't spent $100 million on investing in the people uh, in the city who need it the most, particularly the black people on the south side. I think most importantly, the first thing we can do is to actually provide an investment of that size into the community, be it through workforce development, economic training, education opportunities, and uh, business support. And I think that's where I'll uh, aim in the future. All right, candidate Kaplicki. Yeah, I really think that we need to integrate and also be inclusive in all the different programs that we have around the city. You know, many different ways that we could use our CBA to bolster black owned businesses, especially on the south side. And we can have people in there counseling, you know, providing advocacy and um, out accounting help to help these businesses grow. We need to listen to one another. You know, when it comes down to being part of a neighborhood, there's so many integrated pieces of that fabric and if we can come alongside each other and support each other and come from the north side to the south side from the east and to the west to be alongside one of another in those project pro or uh, those programs i think that's where we make a lot of headway candidate mayo would love it if you would repeat the question okay uh what was the question <laughs> i believe it was about policing oh race relations yes what do you yes. think about race relations in the city and where do you think they stand right now okay so what I see is that there's a divide there and we need to make, we're making strides, but the community policing is a big deal where we have police officers out of their cars, talking to kids, talking to the adults and creating relationships. And I am um, super passionate about that and um, excited about this opportunity to um, work with our policing. And that's been part of my literature. And I talk about this already, that I want to create better relations um, with our residents and our police force. Candidate Danner. Yeah, one of the things that's obvious right now is the amount of wealth being created through real estate. And there's a tremendous opportunity in our black communities to make sure that that happens with them as well. A lot of people own their properties outright. They've, they've had them for a long time, but they need help with paying the homeowner's insurance, with making the improvements on those properties. So they can live out their lives on those properties, have the equity built in there, pass them on to their heirs so that that wealth passes on to them the way it does in the white communities. It's fairly easy to do to have grant programs that will uh, repair the houses, keep them secure from the, the rains and the hurricanes, and then maintain that um, just that ability to uh, realize the equity that we're all realizing in our properties and make sure that it's not just so easy to just sell it to a flipper and take the money and leave. But be able to stay there and pass that on to your heirs would be a fantastic opportunity to better the race relations. All right, um, we're gonna get on this one. Uh, this is what was submitted from the audience the word that is thrown around a lot is equity. Equity, 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 equity. And I want to know, to be specific, what do you mean equity? And then how do you make sure that it's equitably applied throughout the entire city? And we're going to start out with uh, Mr. Danner on that one. Well, there's a, there's a lot of pieces to that, a lot of um, 
what is the equity again equity and wealth equity and access to jobs equity and all kinds of things and it's certainly incumbent on us that anything we do any program we have is applied throughout the city regardless of people's wealth or race um you have grant programs that are fantastic they go to people that know how to write grant programs you know how to they can get a car and race down and deliver it in time to uh, receive those grants. Um, everything we do, we have to realize that just because you offer it to everyone doesn't mean everyone has access to receive it and take benefit of it. So the one of the things we can do in every program we do is make sure that there's an equitable opportunity to apply for it and to receive the benefits from it um, that's going to make the equity and the benefit apply to everyone. Okay, candidate Floyd. Yeah, so the definition of equity is a quality of outcome and so I think that's what we look for specifically is uh, outcomes that match no matter, you know, uh, what your race, gender, or sexual orientation is. And so uh, that looks like, you know, investing in black people's health care because black people live uh, shorter than white people do uh, in care because black people have a uh, higher infant mortality. It looks like uh, investing in the education of black people because uh, they lower they have lower reading levels. Uh, in Pinellas County. And so these are the things that we have to make sure that we that we look to whenever we're talking about equity. And we didn't make we need to make sure that like, you know, when our end our end goal is for everyone, no matter what your race is to the same outcome, you know, if you give everybody the same tools, we have the same outcome. And I think more importantly than that is, uh, you know, make sure we're uh, investing specifically in the people who need it the most in these communities, because, uh, you know, there's uh, income inequality within uh, communities themselves as well. Mr. Kaplicki. You know, equity to me means that if we're running a race and I'm starting 15 feet ahead of you and she's starting 15 feet ahead of me and someone else is 15 feet ahead of the other person, we can create levels and create programs to put everyone on a fair and level playing field. Now, all across the city, we have different needs, you know, but we all have many of the same essential needs. We need food, we need shelter, we need water, we need education, you know, and through and throughout all these plans, I think we need to be looking at policy decisions that we make as a council through a lens of equity. So you know, those programs are going to look different in different parts of the city, but we need to buckle down, do the research and figure out what do you need? What do you need? And how can we put, you on, put each and every person on an equitable level playing field so that we can all achieve great things? Candidate Mayo. Well, I don't know what more I can add. I think you all should just vote us, and I think we'd make a great city council, just the four of us, because those are some really awesome answers. And I, what I see is it's just create, striving to create equal opportunity and then pointing everybody to take advantage of those opportunities. So I think that's super important. But I think, you know, we also need to realize we are not going to make everyone happy. And so I think it's important to create the opportunities, make sure they're easily accessible, and um, just serve our people the best way we can. Great. Candidates have been wonderful. Thank you so much. We're going to switch out right now. Let's first give a round of applause, if we would, please. And thank you for hanging with me as we kind of changed the rules along the way. I hope that was all right with you. I know we had said 30 seconds, but we were having such great conversations. And this is a forum. It's not a debate. So if you folks will please go off the stage that way and the other candidates will come around this way. Johnny Carson, can you play us some traveling music? <laughs> thank you for your flexibility. <laughs>
candidates. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, oh, welcome back, everybody. It's nice <laughs> if I turn on the microphone. That's a broadcast professional here. I've learned the many years. Um, candidates, thank you so much for being here. What we did in the last time, if you watched, uh, uh, we had originally said we would have one minute for the first two questions, which we will. But as the questions come along, if we feel there's a need to go into greater detail, we may ask you to have a one minute response. And I think it's worked out pretty well because some of these are very complicated issues and uh, trying to explain anything in 30 seconds uh, is very, very difficult. All right. So let's start out right now. What makes you the best qualified for the office that you are seeking? Candidate Carlson, you go first. You have one minute. I love St. Petersburg. I was born here. I grew up here. Six of my children grew up here. Ten of my 12 grandchildren are growing up here. I served in the U.S. Air Force in Turkey, came back to my neighborhood, and I've been president of Jungle Terra Civic Association for 16 years. We have two award boards, six feet tall, with awards on both sides of them. We're the most awarded neighborhood in the city. Uh, in addition to that, I got with um, Chief Holloway and founded the Midtown Miracles Martial Arts Programs for kids four to 14 in Midtown. And we've enhanced Walt Fuller Park, Pine Ellis Trail, and Stonehenge Park underneath Tyrone Overpass. We got 22 artists that have painted 21 pillars and 10 walls, the largest of which is 1,400 square feet. So I'm the get her done person that has experience in this process. All right, Mr. Gerdes, you have one minute. Same question. Just give me your reason that you're the best qualified for this office. Thank you. And, and thanks for having me. Um, my name is Copley Gerdes, born and raised in St. Petersburg, uh, married to my beautiful wife, Cecily. We're raising our children here. I think I have about 24 family members in the district alone. I'm very blessed to have all that family here, but, but here's the deal. Uh, I just wanna go to work for the district. Uh, I've built a business from the ground up. I paid for my own education in private school, private college, uh, wasn't a scholarship athlete at a small school. And I wanna take that same work ethic that I have in my business and in, and in college athletics and, and put it to use in the city. I have a three-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son that I want to see grow up here, have kids here and do it just like I did and be really, really proud of what we've done over the next three to four years. Uh, and and I, I'm just raising my hand and asking to go to work. All right, great. Candidate Hornbeck, you have a minute to tell us why you're the best qualified for this job. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle. And I'll tell you, that's a voice I miss hearing. <laughs> John Hornbeck for City Council District 1. I guess the heart of the question is what distinguishes me? It's not that I'm nicer. I, I like both these guys. I'm actually on the board of the, uh, with the, uh, Dr. Carlson for the Neighborhood Association. And I would say that we're all lifelong District 1 residents. I was born and raised in St. Pete, went to high school at Keswick Christian College at the University of South Florida, St. Pete campus and law school at Stetson. So I guess we're all nice people. I think we're smart. I guess what distinguishes us may be career. Um, I've had a lot of people that value the fact that I'm an attorney, and I feel that as an attorney, I'm uniquely qualified to, uh, to uh, analyze complex uh, problems and effectively communicate solutions. Thank you. All right, we go to District 4. Candidate Hanowitz right now. You have a minute to tell us why you're the best qualified. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I've been in District 4 since 2006. I'm born and raised in Florida, born in Tampa, raised in Miami, and they brought me back to beautiful Tampa Bay. I love our district. I've been the president of Crescent Lake Neighborhood Association since 2016. I've built it from the ground up. I have given so much of my time to our community in solving the issues that all our residents have had in our neighborhood. And I want to continue that on city council. Uh, I have been working with our neighborhood to help support our zoned elementary school, Willow Elementary. We brought on mentors. We built learning gardens. I'm on the board of the Shirley Proctor Puller Foundation, which helped bridge the gap for students in South St. Petersburg. And I think it's extremely important to have that experience in the community. I'm an attorney. I'm a former state and federal prosecutor. And and I've learned that the skills that I have as an attorney and the advocacy I've shown for my neighborhood, I can bring to me. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Candidate Mullins, you've got a minute. Great, thank you. Um, hey everyone, I'm Tom Mullins. I'm a first time candidate. Um, I, I guess I'd ask you to treat this like, uh, kind of like a job interview for a you know, new city council member. 
Um, and you know, what are the things you look for in a, in a job candidate? The first thing I think would be, is this a candidate that's likely to contribute new and good ideas to the process, to the city? I, I think actually I've already done that. Uh, I think I was the first candidate for citywide office in this campaign to, uh, to put uh, specific ideas out there uh, in the direction of scrapping the existing redevelopment Tropicana field concepts and starting over with a new RFP process. That idea, I, I think, has since been imitated by two of the, the leading candidates for mayor, and I would notice uh, sounded like some of the District 8 guys might have also warmed up to that. The other thing I'd look at is, you know, will this candidate impact uh, can this Im candidate impact the city? Uh, I'm associated personally with with two uh, significant economic events in the city, which I'll tell you about later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Candidate O'Dowd, you've got a minute to tell us why you're the best qualified. Thank you. Well, first of all, I know some of our, my uh, constituents here were born here. I wish I was. Um, I love the city so much. I've actually lived here, luckily, since 1993 with my wife. Um, I, I'm a financial executive. I've been a CFO. I've been in charge of HR departments contracting, which is very important for this job. Um, uh, I've also been on the board of HONA, which is a historical Northeast Neighborhood Association, and kind of responsible for the infrastructure, for the sidewalks, the street signs, and even some of the flooding that's taking place. Um, we have two children. Uh, both are now in college, or actually one past college. But we were very uh, specific in having our kids go to the Southside schools, Campbell Park, uh, Gibbs High School, Lakewood High School, John Hopkins, and Bay Point. So we've been experiencing a lot of what's going on within the city, uh, both from an educational perspective. I was also a small business owner. We owned uncorked fine wines and accessories on 4th Street for about 10 years. And I've owned property that I've had rental property that I've always rented out at below market. And the current one I have above my garage is extremely cheap and is very affordable. All right, thank you. All right, we go back to another question. And this one, you have a minute again. Give me your three top priorities, things that you would like to accomplish or work on when you are elected. Mr. Hornbeck, you go first. All right, so I'll briefly mention two of them because I want to spend a little bit more time on my very top one. So environmental accountability and sustainability. Here in the audience in the back is Melissa, and I thought it was very important to have a very active member of Sierra Club be part of my team. So I'm really plugged in to the, some of the most important matters that inf impact our environment. Um, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my, first, my number one priority, which is my youth first uh, initiative, youth development. So I live right by Walter Fuller, and I had the privilege of attending Growing up, I would later volunteer over 250 hours and was awarded the Volunteer of the Year by the City of St. Pete. The next year, I was a paid employee. And I want to make sure all kids, despite their socioeconomic background, have access to these wonderful programs. So that investing in my youth and in, in our youth is my very number one priority. Candidate Carlson, same question. You got a minute. Thank you. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> Thank you. My number one priority is parks and lakes, is we have 150 parks and the city is responsible for 72 lakes. They do a great job on the parks. They have not done a good job on the lakes. Jungle Terrace was totally overgrown, 10 acres of weeds. They sprayed it. They had two tons of fish kill. Didn't even know that we had two tons in there. The second thing is youth activities. Healthy neighborhoods make a healthy city. We raise children up healthy. They're going to be healthy citizens in our um, city. Third thing is safety from wide sidewalks that are community sidewalks where everybody can be out on them and be part of the community to um, complete streets done right. The sheriff and the police with social services, SEPTED studies, crime prevention through environmental design. Um, your cell phone is a new sheriff in town, so the citizens need to participate with law enforcement. Candidate Gertis. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'll attach to the back of that safety, uh, especially in District 1. You know, we have got a bit of an epidemic when it comes to car thefts, making sure. And, and frankly, I've been uh, somebody's broken into my car in my home in District 1. We've got to continue to make sure that our neighborhoods are safe, uh, especially locking our cars, making sure that we don't have car break ins, because frankly, that's where a lot of these gun violent crimes are coming from or we're stealing guns out of cars. And so we got, we've got to crack down on neighborhood safety. Um, 
Second would be, we, we have a unique opportunity in District 1 with a lot of commercial real estate to, that is available to be developed, specifically 16 acres of the Raytheon property that is still in flux. They thought they had a solution, they don't now. And so we've got to continue to work on commercial property. Last and certainly not least, we, we need to work and continue to work on our infrastructure as I don't like feeling like I have a flat tire every time I drive down Fifth Avenue, so. Candidate O'Dowd, same question. Uh, I have three specific ones. It's what I talk about everywhere on my uh, email and uh, communications. It's affordable housing. Number, first and foremost, affordable housing. You have to make sure that our uh, public servants, the restaurant people, and the, the working class has a place to live. We're seeing this every the prices for rent and home uh, purchasing just go through the roof, and it's becoming really unaffordable. The sustainable infrastructure, for me, it, that's really important because we've got to stop putting the raw sewage into the uh, into our river, I mean, into our creeks and into the bay. Um, I think there's some people who just celebrated because we didn't have that happen last week when uh, Tropical Storm Hurricane Ella came through, and that's ridiculous. We shouldn't be celebrating that. It should be an expectation that we have for the city that we don't do that. Um, it also goes into the sidewalks, making sure they're ADA compliant. And then my third one is economic development, and that's not from the uh, Central Avenue North. It's Central Avenue and South, period. Thank you. Mr. Hanowitz. Ms. Ms. Anowitz, I was supposed to say candidate. I slipped up. That's, that's all right. Um, first, in, in our district, definitely is affordable housing. I think it's it's really citywide, but we saw the issues in our neighborhood starting early in 2017 when we saw the homes that first-time home buyers would buy and were starting to be torn down. And then you had $800,000 homes built in our neighborhood. And people, you know, you need a diverse housing stock so people can live in a neighborhood, start, you know, maybe single and continue to grow a family in the same neighborhood if they want to or if they don't want to, that's fine. But you have to have that diverse housing stock and we're seeing less and less in that. So affordable housing is a big thing. Um, I think our infrastructure issues are huge. We're a peninsula on peninsula that goes back to our water quality issues. I think everything goes hand in hand. Um, so that's going to be really integral in the future. We have to be ready for those storms. And then the last thing I would say is um, we need to make sure we're going to have growth no matter how you see it. It's happening. And we want to make sure that whatever growth happens, we can keep what keeps our city special. And that has to be something that's in our minds every time we make a decision. Thank you. Candidate Mullins. Sure. Uh, for District 4, I think the top three issues, uh, the first one I would cite, to which I spoke to a little bit before, was the Tropicana field site. Um, I really think that the, the existing redevelopment concepts should be scrapped. I think they're flawed because they, none of them bring a jobs engine. Uh, I think running a new RFP process with uh, to attract a transformative use for that property uh, it's, a, it's astonishing, a property with national significance and huge value. Attracting something that is more transformative that brings a job engine is, uh, is, is really my first priority. Uh, also, uh, I, I think I'm one of the only candidates that you know, has really made noise about uh, watching out, defending against tax increases. Uh, property taxes have creeped up pretty, pretty quickly on us over the last eight or nine years. Um, and then the third issue I would say is really just as you travel around the country, you'll see even before COVID, uh, a lot of the biggest cities in the country were, were declining and the same policies were present in, in most of these large cities. I'd like to play defense against those same policies coming here. All right, we're gonna go a minute on this next one. We've had some good discussions uh, that occurred in the first part of the debate, and I wanna, I wanna continue on with this. There have been a lot of starts and stops, and I've been here since 1986, so I've been around for a while of trying to bring economic development to South St. Petersburg. At one time, had stores, big stores that tried to move into those areas. Publix tried it for a while, they pulled out other ones, and so we've had these food deserts have been created. So I wanna ask each one of you, what is your blueprint for really bringing economic opportunity and equity to South St. Petersburg? And we'll start out, Mr. Geddes, on that one. Yeah, I, well, I think first thing, we've got to continue investing in the programs we have in place, like the Southside CRA, the EDC, and all of these public-private partnerships that we already have. We have to continue and follow through on those programs. Um, specifically to uh, the food desert, I'd be a huge fan of creating a food market today uh, to solve the problem today, and then work with, we, we've lost out on national chains trying to bring them 
uh, to the south side. What we need to do is work with regional and more local uh, businesses and, and thrive with that entrepreneurial spirit to bring that equality to the south side. Because we're not, we've tried that before. We continue to keep trying that, that same thing. That, that's just the definition of insa insanity. We've got to try new ideas with continuing public-private partnerships and continue to invest in the programs that are working uh, so far. Candidate Hornbeck, same question. If you go to my Facebook uh, page, John Hornbeck for City Council, and you scroll down a couple, you'll see a post of me going on a record during a USF forum and speaking about the fact that I truly believe the biggest problem that faces Midtown is the food desert. Okay, so I started working with Wendy Wesley, many of you know her, on the community-owned um, grocery co-op. And my wife, if you scroll one post down, spoke about that from her perspective as a pediatrician. She sees a lot of these kids that are getting their meals from the convenience store. So I think that the biggest problem that we have in Midtown is the food desert. And I think that a community-owned grocery co-op is it sounds like an excellent solution. Candidate Carlson. Yes, we need to increase small businesses and support small businesses that can grow from the ground up and keep improving and enhance that. You know, at the same time, we can look for medium size and large size businesses to come in, but we need to start within the community and grow small businesses from within the community. Candidate Mullins. Sure, I, uh, I think I know something about creating uh, jobs and economic opportunity. Um, I'm associated with two of the biggest economic success stories, uh, I think in the local area. Uh, I'm a 30-year veteran of Raymond James. I'm one of the uh, longtime senior officers there. Uh, most of my ideas for creating empowerment for South St. Pete people rest in the private sector, and, and that's what I know best. But at Raymond James, we've created 8,000 jobs. Uh, we're the number one provider of six-figure compensated jobs in the area. We're the biggest supporter of arts, charitable, uh, and social organizations in the neighborhood. Uh, so that's the type of event that lifts all boats. Um, the other thing I would mention is uh, uh, redevelopment of the trap under success under a better plan can do nothing but help create wider opportunities for folks in South St. Pete. And and thank you, Kennedy Dowd. Yeah. I on part of my number th third thing is the, uh, the economic development for the South Side. I think vocational training needs to start being pushed more for not just on the South Side, but everywhere in our community. We spent the last 50 years telling people if you don't go to college, you're a failure. And that's simply not true. Uh, so I think we need to find a way to focus and attract companies that will train. It could be a union. It could be companies that do the training like that or, or try to invest more into P-TECH uh, to really bring that as a solution. We got to start young. If we can get kids into in third grade at or above state mandated levels, their incarceration rate and dropout rate drops significantly. So the one way to do it is make sure the school system right now has had some real struggles in the south side that we're all aware of. I think we need to look at after school programs for, for not only the youth but also the teenagers and work with companies to, to drive in internships, give them the opportunity of the ideas of what's available to them. Uh, because when you start having dialogue, you'll realize they're awesome, awesome people. And I think that's the way to start at that level. Thank you. Candidate Handowitz. I think we've seen when the city actually focuses in an area, like they focus in downtown, it changes. And we can do that the same in South St. Pete. We have a huge opportunity with redevelopment of Tropicana Field. Frankly, I would like to see I-175 not there, or at least better access from that area to South St. Petersburg. So that way, that way, when it's redeveloped, the benefits from that area go into South St. Petersburg. Um, there is a definite opportunity with a community benefits agreement, and that's going to happen whether or not there's an ordinance. Because frankly, no matter what developer goes in there, there's going to be a community benefit agreement, and that can honestly deal with job opportunities that can deal with training, education, you name it, we can make it happen and we can make sure that the areas that should be lifted need to be lifted. Um, and I think in terms of the food desert, I think we can definitely do more in terms of the Tangerine Plaza area. And we need to tackle some of the murder rates issues that we've had. And that's a community issue that we can address together with the city and also with the police department. Great. I'd like to go another minute on another question. Uh, 
if you've been here long enough, and I, and I say this in a joking fashion, I have friends that live in Shore Acres. And when I asked one of my buddies, why do you live in Shore Acres? He said, because I get to replace my carpet every three years. <laughs> it, it was meant as, as meant was a joke. But in reality, when it comes to environmental issues, we have areas in Pinellas County, in particular in St. Petersburg, that flood all the time. If rising sea levels are going to continue, my question for you on the council is, what are you really going to do that is actually going to have an impact rather than just scratching your heads and saying, yeah, we got to do something, but we don't know what that something is. We'll start out with candidate Carlson. you got a minute. Yes. As to be able to have an impact on what's happening is we have to have a whole continuum from prevention to intervention, to enforcement, to uh, remediation, to, Retroactivity. The specific question was, what are we going to do to prevent flooding, sea level rise? What right. policies could the council actually institute in the next several years that would have an impact? We're going to learn from the Netherlands, which has been living below sea level 20% of theirs and 50% of their country is only 3% above sea level for hundreds of years. We're going to learn from New Orleans, which is, has sections that are below sea levels. We're going to apply that to our own experimental area, which is um, south of, um, north of Snell Isle. So we have an area here that floods, whether it's vaults and pumps or whether it's levees or what, we need to be able to get our own city under control and we have an area which we can experiment with that has experienced serious flooding in more than one occasion in the last 10 years. So. We need to learn from the people who have already engineered solutions to the problem and begin applying it in our own city. Mr. Gertis. Yeah, I think really there are three things here. First and foremost, the, the, the long-term solution is continue with the city's plan and its pledge to be carbon neutral by 2035 and continue to track around that, if not before. That's gonna help us long-term. Short-term, it's really one, two things in tandem with each other. We have to continue with the stormwater master plan. So water's got somewhere to go other than in our streets and in our homes. If we can fix the drainage problem, we can stop some of the low lying flooding where people have to replace their carpet every three years in Shore Acres and in West St. Pete too, it's the same thing. And then uh, the, the third thing is, is we have to continue to invest in barriers, uh, both natural and man-made because we've hundred that are uh, I'm afraid of the, I'm afraid of when it comes. I only lay eight blocks off the water. And so we've got to continue to invest in those barriers. And, and those would be the three top priorities I'd, I'd be talking about. Candidate Hornbeck, same question. So, yeah, I'm a firm believer of the climate crisis. Uh, when I was, uh, I, first time I saw the film uh, Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, and I started the Facebook group with over 4,000 members, I became chair of the Go Green Committee at law school. Um, this is an issue I've wanted to tackle. I think St. Pete's on the right track with what Copley was saying, the ISAP plan, Integrated Sustainability Action Plan. But what I would like to see is a little bit more oversight because all that stuff is good on paper, but if you're not really enforcing it, it's not going to occur. And uh, finally, as we're all saying, is infrastructure. you got to invest in infrastructure. Look, it's not as sexy as talking about Tropicana Field and the future of the Rays and the Pier and all these issues. But really, the infrastructure is one of the best investments we can make. Candidate Hanowitz. So the city right now is looking at the Integrated Water Resources Master Plan, and that's something that we just have to do. I mean, it's going to cost 2 to $3 billion. $2 billion is without bells and whistles. $3 billion is resiliency and sustainability. And if you want to stop all the water issues, we have right now our infrastructure that is old. And when your house, your plumbing's old, guess what? You have to replace it. It's not as nice as a new paint job, but you still have to replace it. And that's where we are right now. And we don't have to look far as to what's happening. We can look to Miami, where it's ground zero in terms of flooding. So that's infrastructure issues that we can deal with. I think they've been put off for a very long time. And it's time that we actually address it. Thank you. Kennedy Mullins. Sure. Um as Lizette mentioned uh, with Miami, I mean, one of the fortunate things, even Shore Acres, I think, is, is probably a, cu a couple decades behind some other communities around the world, like Miami Beach, like Venice, Italy, who have had to deal with this already. Uh, I think 
really taking the best practices from some of those cities is the, the lowest risk, best way to go. And for the time being, for the next couple of decades, I think it's mostly going to be a civil engineering exercise, uh, hardening the city and the neighborhoods uh, against the effects of, of rising sea level, whether that's uh, mangrove fields, uh, raising seawalls, raising the elevation of houses and, and, and people's yards, uh, building breakwaters. Uh, there's a, a variety of techniques, but again, um, we're lucky that there's a couple of guinea pigs uh, out there that are going ahead of us, and we, we don't have to, we won't have to guess at it, I don't think. Kennedy, you're down. Yeah, uh, first of all, I think in the short term, at the small and lifting throughout the city, uh, simply because it's going to start coming. I think it was talked about uh, earlier that every couple of weeks we're going to start having, uh, as we have high tides and storms coming through, eventually we're going to have that flooding. So I think the seawalls is the probably the initial thing we have to start looking at. Um, oyster beds, mangroves are great ways to kind of uh, build up our seashore a little bit and provide some of the protection that we would get from some of the, the waves that would be coming through um, and plant more trees. Hona, we have a budget of 6500 We were able to up it to $7,500, and we actually pay for people within the historical Northeast to plant trees. Um, I think the city should be doubling down on that. So if we have a budget of 6500 they should be, or 7500 they should provide another 7500 or another 15000 so we can build more trees. What does trees do? They cool the environment, and secondly, they actually suck up a lot of water that's already in the or on the ground before it ever gets out to. All right, let's talk about another topic. This one comes from the audience, zoning. Uh, good, bad, and indifferent. Good if you want to control growth, but don't we all think that growth is good? But if you don't control growth, then you create lots of other problems. So generally, I, I want your, your opinions about how city council and the city can use zoning to its advantage without taking away people's private property rights. And Mr. Hornbeck, we're going to start with you. Okay, so there's several solutions, and this is really an issue of affordable housing. And before I talk about my plans, I think it's very important to get everybody on board with it because people in my district, District 1, when you talk to them about affordable housing, a lot of them, honestly, they don't care. Everybody's for affordable housing. They just don't want it in your, their own backyard. So I think it really starts with educating people that this isn't just Section 8 housing and the transient crowds. This is uh, firefighters, you know, workforce house, housing, this is elderly, this is disabled people. So the first thing we get in order to have everybody on board with this is education. So upzoning, we, we can allow for loosen some of the regis, uh, uh, regulations on mother-in-law suites and, and allow existing buildings for people to rent out because we're kind of killing two birds with one stone. We're allowing these homeowners to make more money and also having people uh, be able to afford housing. Candidate Carlson. Yes. The <laughs> Thousand people a day move into the state of Florida. That's a city the size of Tampa every single year. Those people are going to all the cities in Florida. So growth is something that we can't stop. We have to be able to deal with it creatively. And we need to maintain the character and the charm of the city of St. Petersburg. And at the same time, we have to be able to accommodate growth. And so we have to be creative about that, inventive, and be attentive to our city and keeping the character and the charm of St. Petersburg. Mr. Curtis. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we see this a lot about zoning on the Community Planning and Preservation Committee. You know, I think we need to continue to look at creative ways to look at mixed use, uh, to continue to look at mother-in-law suites and, and uh, auxiliary dwelling units on properties. And I think some of those are coming along, but we've got to continue to come up with new and creative ideas that create opportunity uh, to use some of these zoning features uh, that we have in the 2050 master plan already to make sure that, and we communicate to them. That's what's happening is that we, we've got a lot of good stuff. St. Pete, everybody up here has talked about what a great city it is. We've got a lot of great opportunity already. We got to communicate it to, to people so they know what's going on. And so we, we've just got to make sure that they know that they've got the opportunity and continue to invest in those programs that have, op, that have the mixed use planning and the 2050 planning zoning. Candidate Hanowitz. 
we just went through the Vision 2050 process. This is a visioning process that does exactly this, address zoning. We did it back in 2020. You know, we had the Vision 2020. Uh, so the bottom line is the zoning is going to be changing based on what the needs are going to be in the city. And right now, through this process, what's going to happen is our comprehensive plan has to change, and so do the land development regulations. And this is going to go through a public process. That means that we're going to get input from everyone in the city in terms of what are the issues and how can we change the zoning. I think we're going to see some changes in terms of the corridors, because that's where you have a lot of the transportation that's going to go through the city. And if you're going to have affordable housing, you want people to have affordable housing that has transportation. So those things go hand in hand. So I think you're going to be some, seeing some of those changes. I also think that there's going to be changes in accessory dwelling units. We have those in our neighborhoods. And I think you're going to see more of those, because the accessory dwelling units allow for smaller smaller apartments that people can live and also help people with their mortgages. Thank you. Kennedy Mullins. Sure. Um, on zoning, uh, Houston, Texas is kind of famous for being the largest U.S. city without widespread zoning. Um, let me go on record and say I do not want St. Pete to look like Houston, Texas. Um, the, uh, I'm in favor of zoning. Uh, I, I like having some predictability and, and, and consistent character for the, the various neighborhoods of the city. Uh, it, it's that said, uh, there, there really will need to be, I think, a lot more flexibility in the way we do zoning going forward. Uh, Florida is, is growing. Everyone is coming here, whether they're coming from misgoverned cities up north or they're coming from uh, all points in Latin America. People are pouring in here, and you, you've, you, you're simply going to have to, um, people are going to have to get, I think, comfortable and, and understand that if you want to keep housing at all affordable, uh, we're going to have to tolerate some areas of, of the city, even ones outside of downtown, that will have uh, higher density than they, they have now. The good news is most of St. Pete outside of downtown is developed at fairly low density. It's all single-family residential. Can I down? Yeah, I think you have to look at this uh, zoning along with the uh, the infrastructure because we can continue to grow, but if we don't build our infrastructure to support it, we're going to end up continuing to do the raw sewage into the creeks, into the into the bay. Um, but having said that, I think if we get to that point where the infrastructure is solid, I think we have to work within the 2050 plan and we have to look at uh, and talk to the communities because what works in Uptown does not work necessarily in distant heights or Central Oak Park, um, Snell Isle. And I think we just need to work with each community to find out what is what what do they want to see as part of that vision. Do they want to sit there and have a higher density? Would they, do they prefer having the garage apartments or in-law suites? And at what density level? You also have to look at the parking because in some of the cities like Uptown, if you continue, I don't know how you could put much more into Uptown uh, from the density perspective, but again, that would cause a huge issue with parking. So every um, neighborhood is different. So let's uh, make sure we talk to them and respect their wishes and move it forward. We have a wonderful arts district that's developed. Uh, I, I loved it when people say, well, it just sprung up overnight. Well, it's 20, 20 years springing up overnight, but we have a beautiful arts district. How do you make sure that those kind of areas of St. Petersburg are still preserved without slamming in 50,000 apartments? I'm exaggerating, but if you go around Tropicana Field and you look at all those apartments, you go, holy smokes, where are all these people coming from? So how do you continue to support the arts district without it being crowded out because you've got so many people that you can't have those small enclaves of artists? And we'll start out with uh, Mr. Gertis. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is big to my heart. Um, all through grade school and high school, uh, I was a drama geek. Uh, I was the president of my drama troupe in high school, sang all through college. And so the arts hits home for me and we've got to continue uh, to invest. And I know St. Pete has, is, is known to be an arts community. We've got to continue to, to have that feel and that culture. This goes a little bit back to the, to the previous question too. We've got to make sure when we're developing this plan that we're taking that into account, that we're not just, we're not just saying, Hey, we've done a good job over the last 20 years. We've got these, this thriving arts community so we can continue to focus on density and high rises and things like that. We've, we've got to think again, going back to the 2050 plan, that that is part of the St. Pete culture. We need to keep it and protect it, but also continue to invest in it. Uh, this wasn't an investment of the last 20 years. It needs to be an investment of the next 20 years as well. Candidate Hornbeck. 
So I was like Copley, I was a fine arts major in high school and, and I love our community. There was an article that came out in 2018 by the New York Times, 52 must go places before you die. And this isn't Huffington Post, this is the New York Times. And they rated us there. And one of the major reasons is because of our art scene, right? Um, I'm a member of the James uh, Museum. I, when I was in college, I'm not exaggerating, I went to the Salvador Dali Museum every single day. I love the Chihuly Museum. So I, I really love uh, how much art and, and culture we have here in St. Pete, and I take a lot of pride in it. Kennedy Carlson. General Terrace has contributed to the art in our city by beneath Tyrone Overpass. This mayor said he was gonna spend $500,000 on underpass art on one section in St. Petersburg. We said we have paint a pillar on Tyrone Overpass, so we put it on St. Pete Art Alliance. One day, they took it down and said, you have to get permission from FDOT. I said, our Florida legislator is our FDOT liaison. We had six artists that supplied, that applied then, and they in turn told other artists, and it grew to where we had 22 artists that painted 21 pillars and 10 walls, and we got 10 pages in the St. Pete art book on murals. So there are things that neighborhoods can do, the things that the city can do. So we need to keep our neighborhoods participating in the process. Kennedy Drowned. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, so uh, first and foremost, I think what we can do is as we have certain developments, whether it be Tropicana Field or any other site, I think we should allocate uh, some of that uh, development to allowing for local artists to have a location within the site uh, it, because we have to have art and when we, when we build uh, buildings and what have you, I think it should be a local artist that does it. That way we can continue keeping that money in here and, and providing them um, the opportunity to showcase what they do. Um, I've Talking to the St. Pete Supports the Arts, one of the things they're looking into, or we might want to look at is the guaranteed income that San Francisco just released uh, within the last uh, within the last six months, I believe. And that's, uh, I think, something interesting to at least look at. Um, and I think one of the, when I was talking to Duncan McCullen a few weeks ago, he thought it'd be great if any of the developments have it, you could have like windows where the local artists could support and showcase what they have with the location of where they're where they're doing their wares, and that way you have a, a, another connection to the uh, to the arts. Candidate Hanowitz. So I, I think no one can deny how important the arts is to our city. I mean, when the Salvador Dali collection, they were trying to find a home, and that person that came up and said it should be St. Petersburg, and look at where we are today with how many museums have come here, and we have to have a place for our budding artists in this community because they are our lifeblood. So in terms of what we can do, whenever there is an opportunity where taxpayer money is going in terms of a development, uh, we need to make sure that somehow the arts are involved. If there is a project and there is a development and you can have arts to be a part of it, then that's something that we to need to ensure that we do. In terms of the redevelopment of Tropicana Field, like it was mentioned, I think it is important to make sure that part of that is in a, a place where you can have artists on clubs. And in terms of other areas in the city, I think we need to promote art. You know, different neighborhoods should have grant monies that can go to art projects. And we've had done and we've done that through matching grants um, and gotten murals in neighborhoods, and we can continue to do that through other art projects. Thank you. And candidate Mullins. Sure. Um with respect to the arts, there's there's really only one thing that sustains um, a, a strong arts culture in a city. Not surprisingly, that one thing is money. Um, and so I guess I would, this isn't necessarily a, a matter of uh, municipal regulation or anything. I would just encourage people, uh, go to the art shows, buy art for your home, buy it from living artists, even if you're a billionaire, and we do have a few here locally, uh, don't buy trophy Picassos, buy good art from, from living local artists. And that's what sustains the art community. Um, I'll expand the topic a little bit to talk about architecture also. Uh, you know, one thing I would, uh, would, would endorse here is, you know, as we think about going to higher density housing and development in some areas of the city where that's suitable, uh, I, I, I commit to you, I, I will not uh, support any boring buildings. <laughs> uh, we need to, yeah, to be consistent with the arts culture, we need to be con have great architecture here too. Thanks. All right, <clears throat> we got time for about one more question. 
Uh, we asked the other candidates because the word equity has been thrown around a lot lately and a lot of people define it differently. Uh, but in terms of race relations, there are people in, in South St. Petersburg and other parts that, that don't feel that they've been treated fairly. And that's, that's the way it is around the country a lot. So we hear the word equity, but I want to know what it means to you in your mind. And then even more importantly, how do you implement equity and develop a tool to measure equity to make sure that what you're proposing actually is working? And we'll start out with candidate Carlson. Yeah, yeah, Doc. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll give you the nudge. I'm a, I'm a hundred. <laughs> wake up. I'm hundred percent for equality. I'm hundred percent for equity. Equity is based on need, and equality is based on we're all brothers and sisters, and we treat each other with love and and equalness. So, equity goes to back to neighborhoods again. I know what Jungle Terrace neighborhood needs. We have a hundred neighborhoods plus in this city. I don't know what the other neighborhood next to us needs or the neighborhood on the south side needs, or the neighborhood in Snow Isle needs, or the other neighborhoods. So the key is I need those neighborhoods to tell me what they need so that I can advocate for that and help each neighborhood accomplish being healthy because healthy neighborhoods build a healthy city. Mr. Gertis. Yeah, I, when, when I think about equity, I think about driving through this city and uh, and seeing the progress of the city throughout its entirety. We don't see that right now. We have got to continue to invest in the areas where we're not providing equity and overfund. I think uh, Ms. Hanowitz said it. We, we've got to overfund into those until that happens, until you can drive across north to south, east to west, and you see the same opportunity across the city because right now you don't. And until that happens, we don't have it. Now, are, are we getting there? I think so. I think we've done some good things to, to move the needle. But when, when I think about equality, I think about driving on every street and seeing the same progress. And until we do that, we haven't gotten there. So what is equity? Well, it's really equal rights. And I spoke about, um, and as an attorney, I've really fought for this for, for many years. I've talked about, I want the people in Midtown to have the equal access to safe, affordable, healthy, nutritious food as we, as people in my district do. Um, I talked about youth, right? I wanna make sure every kid, despite their socioeconomic background, has equal access to the wonderful um, programs that made me the man I am today. These programs are social programs or fitness driven programs. So if you want to find out more about me, uh, you can visit votehornbeck.com and you'll see um, a little bit more. Thank you. Candidate Mullins. Sure. I think, <clears throat> I think the, the definition of equity, as I understand it, is the same one that I think Richie Floyd mentioned in the prior panel, which is equality of outcome. And I, you know, I will tell you, I, I find that uh, a bit problematic. I believe in equality of opportunity. I believe in special effort, making special efforts, devoting real resources to, to give people, uh, give people an advantage uh, that may not have had uh, every advantage growing up or that had gotten some bad breaks or made some bad decisions uh, in their early years. Um, I'm for all that, but, but, the, the, our, our current tax code and social policy and all that ha already has fairly substantial redistributive characteristics. Uh, I would tell you though, radically changing that to take resources uh, and capital by force from one group of people to give it to others um, is something honestly I'm uncomfortable with. And um, well, uh, that's, that's where I come out. Mr. O'Dowd. Uh, Southern New Hampshire University has a great commercial, and the president in that commercial says that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And in this city, the opportunity is lacking in the South Side. Um, I, I'm a big believer in bringing the, the, uh, the uh, Tropicana Field in the South Side CRA, which will force, or at least if we live up to it, should allow that development to really participate, have everyone participate from North and South. 
Um, there are small businesses. If none of you have ever been to Wangs and Fangs on 16th Street South, they make the best cheeseburger. I mean, we always hear about El Cap, which is great. And we hear, but go to Wings and Fangs, and I promise you, you will have one of the best cheeseburgers. But how does he get the opportunity to expand beyond 16th Street, right? And I think we have to find incentives for small businesses to 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 expand their ability for us and everyone in the community to get to there. 15 seconds. So the other thing I would suggest that we I talked about earlier is vocational training and after school programs for the kids. Again, we've got to show them the opportunities that are available to them and give them those opportunities and even incentivize businesses to give them internships. Thank you. And candidate Howitz. So to me, basically, it means providing resources where they're needed so you can at least level the playing field. It's not going to be perfect, but you try. And we have a city where we live in, some of us live in neighborhoods that we don't have to worry about walking out of our door. And there are parts of our city where people actually have to worry about getting shot. That's not equitable. We are as good as our worst neighborhood that has crime. That's who we are. And we need to think about it that way. We need to make sure that every neighborhood here, every resident feels safe and every resident can start a business in their neighborhood and not have to worry about, you know, whether or not they can, you know, walk out of their door and, and something's going to happen, whether or not they're going to have a good school to send their kid to. Uh, they should have the same opportunities in, in every part of our city. So to me, that's what equity is. When every neighborhood in our city, every part, we can look proudly and say yes. They're being, they have the same thing as every other part. Thank you. All right, candidates, thank you so much for your time. We've come to an end of this evening, and uh, candidates, thank you so much for your time. Audience, thank you so much for being very nice to us as well. Just going to remind you that a recorded version of tonight's forum will be closed captioning, will be available on the League's Facebook page and the YouTube channel coming up in a couple of days. And uh, two things, don't forget to register to vote. That's the 26th. And then tomorrow night, same time, same place, here at the Allstate Center, the League of Women Voters and uh, the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions will be here live with the candidates for mayor. So if you'd like more information about that and the candidates you've seen here, you can also go to vote411.org. Kimberly, thank you so much. Really enjoyed this, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow night, too. I am, too. I want to thank all of you all for coming out and braving the weather and giving us really valuable information about where you stand on positions. We want to thank you and, of course, the candidates who had to leave in District 8. And we welcome all of your input. The Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions is a community and local, regional, and state-based organization dedicated to having these civil conversations. We appreciate your support and invite you to learn more about us at isps.spcollege.edu or to follow us on Facebook. And thank you, Al. Look forward to working with you tomorrow night. Great. It's going to be good. Thanks. Thank good you. night, everybody.